Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is Michael Foley, a 1984 graduate of St. Norbert College, and we'll discuss his time at St. Norbert, the future of science in higher education, and his career path. Michael Foley is director of the Chemical Biology Platform at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. He joined the Broad Institute in 2006 as director of the Chemical Biology Platform. Under his leadership, Foley oversees all aspects of chemical libraries and chemical screening at the Broad. Foley was a co-founder of Infinity Pharmaceuticals and served as Vice President of Chemistry from 2001 to 2006. He obtained his PhD at Harvard and helped establish the Harvard Institute of Chemistry and Cell Biology. Michael, welcome to St. Norbert College, or Thanks I should so say, welcome back. It's great to be back. So you are uh, one of our proud graduates. Thank you. And uh, I just was uh, figured I'd start off by asking a little bit about your experience here. So you graduated here in 1984. Graduated in 84 with a chemistry degree. Um, you know, it was just a great experience being here. My best friends to this day are still my classmates from St. Norbert's. Just had a dear friend out uh, last week who was coming through Boston, you know, just stopped by for dinner. And, uh, you know, it was nice to think about this today. This morning after we speak, I'm going to go give two lectures to the organic chemistry classes here. And on the plane right out yesterday, I was thinking, oh my God, it's been 30 years since I sat in that room. And, you know, just thinking about what I knew then and what was confusing to me about how the whole uh, biomedical field works and now what I've been able to learn over the 30 years since. And so I'm going to try to package up a lecture today for the kids in those classes to say, I wish somebody had given me this talk 30 years ago so I'd have some perspective on how what I'm learning in this class is actually going to be applied in the real world. So the experience here was just invaluable, just the best people I've ever met. There's just something different about the St. Norbert community versus any other place that I've ever been. Just different, I don't know if nicer, better, I don't know what the word is, but there's just a different connection to the people that um, I went to school with here. Well, that's one of the things that we're trying to do here, actually, is to make sure that the connection between faculty and students is the, the most central thing that we, that, that we have. It's kind, of, it's kind of like graduate school experience in some ways, the connection mm -hmm. that you have with your faculty. Speaking of graduate school, you, uh, before, between St. Norbert and Harvard, you were somewhere else. Is that correct? Yeah, so I started my career in the pharmaceutical industry on the junior staff. So I worked for uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb um, in Wallingford, Connecticut. Well, it was Bristol-Myers when I started. And this was just as the pharmaceutical industry was beginning to undergo its massive change that you now see uh, uh, fully realized. So Bristol-Myers had been very successful, and then they merged with the Squibb Corporation. And so there were all kinds of changes there. And um, I decided that I would move out of that environment, and I went to Glaxo, which was in uh, Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. What I really liked about Glaxo was that it was a startup kind of environment, even though Glaxo was a 100-year-old company at that point. They had just come to the U.S. They bought a vitamin company in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, so that they would have a foothold in the U.S. so they could begin marketing their first blockbuster product called Zantac for ulcers. So over time then they built a, um, a research facility in RTP and while that facility was being built they rented space at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And so we started out in the basement of Venable Hall at UNC uh, getting Glaxo going. It was a true startup experience but what was different from a typical biotech startup was there was an unlimited budget because there was a multi-billion dollar blockbuster drug behind the effort. So money was no object. You could just go as fast and as hard as you wanted on all of your projects. And so that was a, a great learning experience and watching a company be built from about five people up to about 30,000 in a very short period of time, five to seven years. So while I was at Glaxo, I began to, because I kind of got in on the ground floor, understand better the process of drug discovery, how the different groups have to work together because we were hiring the different groups as we were coming together, and what the real process is, what the bottlenecks are. And so I began the first high-throughput chemistry facility for Glaxo in, in their corporate history. And because that was very successful, they, um, my superiors noticed that Stuart Schreiber at Harvard University was starting a similar effort in the academic setting. <clears throat> and they thought it would be useful if they had some Glaxo employees go learn from the experts up at Harvard so they could be even more efficient at this. 
So luckily for me, Glaxo paid for my full salary, all the tuition at Harvard, plus a monthly stipend for my research expenses when I went to Harvard. So it was a very nice way to go to graduate school. As you know, um, having been a starving student yourself, actually with my industrial salary, I was probably making more money than entry-level professors. Um, wow. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a very sweet situation. And so... I finished my PhD, and while I was going through this, I was having conversations uh, with my advisor, Stuart Schreiber, uh, who's a very, very famous chemist, um, responsible for many things, not the least of which is figuring out how drugs like rapamycin and FK506 modulate the immune system, so gave us some real insights for the first time into how the immune system uh, works through those, uh, those small molecules. And this was at the time when uh, the HIV was just becoming... It was a slightly, discovered, I guess. Yeah, slightly post um, HIV being discovered. This was, you know, the protease inhibitors were out there. The main contribution that was going on to the field at that time in HIV was the uh, concept of the drug cocktails. Uh, for um, so you would have a reverse transcriptase inhibitor along with a protease inhibitor and things like that, and trying to hit the uh, viral replication cycle at multiple points in order to knock it down. And actually that really stuck in my mind. It's interesting you you use that example because it ended up being the inspiration for the first company I started, which was Combinatorix, um, before Infinity Pharmaceuticals. But while I was at Harvard finishing up my PhD, now I was obligated to go back to Glaxo. I had a $500,000 contract. Either if I didn't go back, I had to write them a check for 500,000, which I didn't have. Um, or go back work day for day before I was liberated from that contract. So Schreiber was starting this um, institute for chemistry and cell biology, and he needed somebody to run it because it was the, believe it or not, the first collaboration between Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences on the traditional Harvard campus that you think of in Cambridge and the medical school on Longwood Avenue. And so in almost 200 years, they'd never collaborated on anything. And so they were setting up this new institute for chemistry and cell biology in the cell biology department on the Longwood Medical School campus. So Schreiber is over at the Cambridge campus and he needed somebody in Boston. So he got Harvard to buy me out of my contract and give me a faculty position in cell biology over at um, Harvard ICCB. And then while I was there, inspired by the HIV cocktails, it started Combinatorix, which is a publicly traded company which has now changed names, it's called Zalicus. Um, which was combinations of FDA-approved drugs um, for multiple diseases, in addition to Infinity Pharmaceuticals, which I founded with Stuart Schreiber. So, um, so yeah, that was sort of the span between, that break between um, St. Norbert's and Harvard was working in industry, and then once I got to Harvard, seeing the future of drug discovery, decided not to go back to Glaxo, but to try to cut a new path and um, create biotech companies that can test out the new technologies and approaches to drug discovery. Yeah, I think that most uh, folks who are watching probably don't realize how tight the connections are between um, some of the drug companies and some of the um, uh, some of the medical equipment manufacturers and the faculties at medical schools and, and other things. And, and that uh, with with that comes some interesting uh, challenges. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we would like to think of ourselves as being uh, put away in this ivory tower. But the fact is, the money necessary to buy all those fancy labs has to come from some place. That's exactly right. So how, how, does a, how does a professor navigate that without losing sight of what it is that they're there to do, either the, the, the quote-unquote purity of the research, or uh, I would assume there was some teaching involved that, uh, that was there, particularly with graduate students. How do, you, how do you deal with that on a daily basis? Yes, yeah, so for the basic science professors, use Schreiber as an example, where he's looking at chemistry, new starting points for drug discovery, new targets, it's less of an issue for him. M mind, it, he, mind you, he has to bring in money. And he and, and me as well, we will go to pharmaceutical companies for that money to fund projects, uh, rarely with any strings attached. It's really difficult for Harvard or MIT to allow these folks to invest, if you will, in projects and then have some right of first refusal or something that just it doesn't look right, and then you could be accused of exploiting students. It's really got to be a, a gift or some sponsored research type of thing where you can then publish uh, broadly. And if you do grant a license to a patent, it has to be non-exclusive. I think the folks that really run into problems are the uh, 
professors who are also practicing physicians because they can be passionate about an area of biology, convinced that it will have medical benefit, and they'll want to be involved with running some of the trials. But if they were ever funded by one of those pharmaceutical companies, it, it appears to be double dealing and that they might run their clinical trials in a way that um, would make the drug look better or they're just more biased in their experimental design. And of course, when you're experimenting on human beings, that experimental design has to be absolutely flawless. Um, defensible in every way, shape, and form. There is no way that you're experimenting on human beings in order, in a way that's going to give you some financial benefit or increase probability of that financial benefit. So it's those professors who are really in a tough spot because they work their entire lives to figure out these, you know, biological pathways or insights, and then frustrated if they can't participate in seeing that all the way through to its uh, conclusion because of the appearance of conflict. Now obviously there are enough cases that have been documented where professors have maybe given in to some temptation in their experimental design and of course that's well documented but those are very few and far between those types of cases. These folks are if they wanted to make money, they're so smart, they'd find other ways, you know, stock market or some yeah. other way to make money. If it was just purely a greed play, they, they would have found a different way to get there faster than through academic science. So. Yeah, getting a PhD in biochemistry is not the simplest way to go and become rich, I think. That's exactly right. There are, <laughs> there are other ways to do it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, some software a concept or something that can be turned. It's funny, we just had a great presentation from a fellow named Roy Rose in it, Intuit where they're looking at two week cycle times between concept and launching a, a prototype product on the internet, you know, and you know, that's how you get rich. Um, studying biochemistry for six or seven years, getting your PhD, doing four or five more years as a postdoctoral fellow before getting an entry level professor job and scraping for grants, which we all know are very, very difficult to come by these days because of the funding situation down in Washington. So. Yeah, there are much more efficient ways to get rich. <laughs> you, know, you know, and actually, I think that's, uh, I think that's a bit of an issue because, uh, um, you know, when I grew up, the space program was a big deal. Oh, absolutely. And it was cool to be a scientist. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, if you look at the popular culture, television, you know, the, uh, and, and think about how, what it looked like to be a scientist in the 1960s yeah. versus how science was portrayed in the 1990s. Right. You know, it, it was almost a joke in, in, to be a scientist yeah. there. And I think that one of the issues that's happened in the U.S. and around the world is that just what you say, it's much easier to become rich if you're smart and quantitatively inclined going to Wall Street yes. than it is to you, to become a medical doctor or, or uh, some other kinds of a scientist. And in, in some ways, I, I, I kind of blame the Ivy League schools for mm. sending their best people to Wall Street in that in that kind of an environment, that they're very highly competitive, you know, uh, the ends justifies the means kind of, kind of thing. Sure. So, I mean, certainly the, a lot of the best and the brightest from those schools headed to Wall Street to make their fortune. You know, I don't know if they were encouraged by the professors to do that. You know, it's not a prison. You know, it's still America. And if there's that lure of quick cash, um, you know, it, sometimes it's overwhelming, particularly for, for young folks who might be in a lot of debt from school. Right. <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, a lot of great people ended up there. You know, it's going to be interesting. You know, it's interesting to point that out. Let's see what happens now, because Wall Street's not hiring, as mm -hmm. you know, and they haven't hired for about four years. And now we've got those really bright kids out there doing other things. I read in Harvard Magazine, a lot of these folks who would have ended up in hedge funds down on Wall Street are you know, doing volunteer work now and trying to build up their resume. And it'll be interesting to see if there's something quantitative that comes out of that that we can then measure and say that they did more or less good for society by taking a different path. But certainly that spigot to Wall Street's been shut off by you know, all the scandals um, in the past five years. Right. So. If you look at Asia, China and India in particular, but other places, you know, there is a, a much greater emphasis, both from a government policy point of view, but also culturally, on on learning science and math. Oh, absolutely! And we, we're we're up to speed on the Kardashians. We are. We, we are. are indeed. <laughs> and uh, I, I, you were mentioning uh, before we went on the air about how uh, some of the drug companies are actually starting to outsource some of the some of the research to uh, to less expensive countries. 
Yes, and so there are multiple reasons for that. The primary reason is in India, that's the largest emerging middle class in the world. And so you need to set up operations there if you're Merck, Amgen, Pfizer, Glaxo. And so the best way to do that is to contract work out to folks in that different economy. So now you're going to get a lower price point for your full-time employees, your FTEs. But what you're also doing is transferring knowledge to that region because you have to teach these folks how to do the work. They have no clue how to uh, execute or didn't have a clue, they do now, on how to execute a, a drug discovery program. So now you're educating the local um, folks to be able to now operate drug discovery companies when you move into that region um, you know, full time. And so you basically now there's the leading edge where they're beginning to market their products in India and China, the pharmaceutical companies. But then to be sustainable, the governments won't let them just market there. They've got to have um, established research facilities as well as production facilities. And so if nobody in the local economy is able to actually operate those facilities, you've got a big problem because it's just too hard to move that many folks from the U.S. and Europe into India or China to successfully operate in those regions. So that's a, a you know, cost cutting is just one part of it, but they're also beginning to establish themselves in those markets. If you look at the U.S. and European market, they've really leveled off and they will be level for the foreseeable future. But there are some astounding rates of return in the BRICS nations, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, the BRIC nations. These are the emerging economies, and you could be looking at compounded annual growth rates of about 13% versus a static 1% growth in the U.S. and Europe. So they're almost like living organisms, these companies. They're obligated now to go to where they can grow. There's a, a fuel source, which is money, uh, there because of the growing economies, and so they're obligated to, to move over there. Uh, and so... Some of that is really hurting because if you've picked up a newspaper, you'll notice almost every month or so a pharmaceutical company is laying off people. And I think last year we lost 100,000 100, jobs in the U.S. in the pharmaceutical industry. Those are probably somewhere between 100000 and $150,000 a year salaries. So now you're shifting those people from 150 k where they're paying taxes and paying, buying into the local economy to now being on the government dole. That's a huge shift. And so we, you know, the more industries that go through this, the tougher it's going to be to keep the U.S. economy uh, rolling. And so that's a big problem. Now, there are different countries. So I've set up two companies in Singapore. Combinatorics had a, a facility there, and we ended up selling that. And Infinity, I mean, Forma Therapeutics, uh, another company I founded, has an operation in Singapore now. That's a little bit different. That's uh, First world economy, they um, honor international patent law, unlike China and India right now. Um, it's as expensive as operating in Manhattan, and so you're not going to get a real economic incentive. And the government does try to mitigate that with some grants and, and loans and things like that. But the local economy is, or the local folks are so well trained that you can actually operate a drug discovery effort in Singapore right now. And then with the grants and uh, other tax breaks, it's, it makes financial sense to have, a, have groups over there. So that's been a, a, a very nice entry into the Asian market going through Singapore. It's actually, when you go over there, I always tell people and they ask what it's like. It's like a really, really long trip to San Diego because everyone <laughs> speaks English. It's beautiful weather. It's McDonald's, Burger King, dollars and cents. You know, it's just so easy. But you're in Asia and you're operating there. No and chewing it, gum, though. No <laughs> chewing gum. You don't want to get caned, um, <laughs> which they do. Um, and so that's a nice way to then get into the uh, China and India markets. But, um, but the world in the pharmaceutical industry is changing so, so much right now, with those being the real drivers right now, China and India and Brazil coming on very strong. You're watching Conversations from St. Norbert College. Joining us is St. Norbert graduate Michael Foley. Michael, let's talk a little bit more about the, the drug business, and in particular, the drug approval business. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like you have an idea for a drug, and then you walk down to the local Walgreens and say, hey, would you sell this would for me? Sell, it's, not, right. it's not like it was 100 years ago. That's um, exactly right. Talk a little bit about what that process is like. So right now in the modern era, our new drug targets, how we're going to intervene in disease initiation and progression, the new approaches are coming through genetics. And so 
you know, the human genome was just sequenced for the first time 10 years ago. It was only 10 years ago, but every one now in the biomedical industry is impacted by that and the subsequent studies. And so what they're able to do now is look at um, common diseases and they can find their, through these genome-wide association studies, they can find links between gene variation and disease. Now it's just correlation. And then there's an am amazing amount of work that has to go on to say, is it just correlation or is it also cause and effect? And so once you've got cause and effect, you say, absolutely. And let me just make this more specific. There's a common disease called Alzheimer's disease. Very, very difficult disease. Many, many uh, ways that disease is initiated and many different biological pathways that are activated and inactivated to allow it to progress. So there isn't just one magic bullet that you can look at to knock out Alzheimer's. So you've got to look at the totality of the genome through these genome-wide association studies and say, we're going to look at the genomes of 30,000 people who don't have Alzheimer's and 30,000 who do. What's similar? What's different? And that gives us an idea of the targets we should go after. Genetics told us that inhibitors of gamma secretase, just a protein, um, should be effective in Alzheimer's, treating Alzheimer's disease. Lots of companies went out. Now what you do is you create a multi-million member collection compound library, and I'm going to screen it against gamma secretase to find small molecules that can inhibit this protein target. That's the starting point for drug discovery, and maybe 10 years after that, we're going to be able to put it in people after figuring out that it's maybe. safe. <laughs> maybe. Safe, effective, gets to the um, target of interest. It's got to cross the blood-brain barrier, very high bar. This is going to be for elderly people, so you don't want to inject them. They've got to be able to swallow a pill, so it's got to be orally bioavailable. Then once in the body, there's another barrier, the blood-brain barrier, which you know obviously designed to keep toxins out of our brain. It's got to cross that, then get to the target and inhibit the target, gamma secretase. So Eli Lilly was one company that uh, went after gamma secretase, developed their compound, so the infrastructure cost tens to hundreds of millions of dollars to create the infrastructure to make the compounds, screen them for inhibitors of this target, then do the MedChem to find a compound suitable for human administration. Lilly went to phase one, showed the compound was safe. Phase two, some sense that the compound would be active. Each of these, phase one was probably 2,000 patients, phase two, 2,000. They went to a higher patient population number of 2,600 for phase three for gamma secretase. They thought it was going to work. So they're telling Wall Street, I've got a multi-billion dollar blockbuster on the way. I'm probably $800 million into this compound right now. They unveiled the data from phase three and showed not only did gamma secretase not work, the inhibitors, it made the condition worse. This has brought Eli Lilly to its knees, and it's not clear that venerable Eli Lilly is going to survive this. You just can't endure these losses. So what this generation of scientists has to do, and their entire careers will be defined by this, we have to understand the biology of new genes of unknown function discovered through the human genome projects. So gamma secretase looked like a great target. We didn't fully understand the biology. We went to human clinical trials, spent a ton of money, got everyone's hopes up that there was you know, some treatment for Alzheimer's, and Wall Street excited that Lilly is going to be you know, wildly successful, and all of that crashed down because we didn't understand the biology well enough. And so this generation of St. Norbert students and students around the world their entire life's work in biomedical field will be defined by the statement of understanding the biology of genes of unknown function. Because we, we have to get new methods of treating diseases. We've got everything that we understand we can treat pretty well right now, but autism, Alzheimer's, we, you and I were discussing the antibacterial problem, train wreck coming at our kids with resistant bacteria, and we don't have a clue as to how to stop that. And so these are the challenges the next generation faces. Um, you know, I graduated in 84, so I'm 50 years old. My generation isn't going to finish the job. And so these kids really have to take a different tact in their career. When I was a student in 84, it was good enough just to be a chemist. These kids have to think of themselves as scientists with maybe a chemistry specialty, and they will bring any tool to bear on solving these um, big biological problems. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this uh, antibiotic problem. I mean, sure. we. 
grew up, I'm about the same age as you, yeah. and we grew up and if you got something, went to the doctor, they gave Absolutely. you a pill, it went away, occasionally there was a reaction, but there was another pill. That's right. Um, that's different now. It what, is. Why is it different and what does the future look like? Future is really scary. Um, so what's going on now? We had a big rush to drug discovery in the anti-infectives area. Um, 1920, the first drugs came out, believe it or not, from the German dye industry some sulfonamide drugs. So you hear about the sulfa drugs. They have all kinds of horrible side effects, but hey, if you're dying from a bacterial infection, you'll take some tough rashes just so you can live. So then in the 40s, along comes penicillin and a number of other drugs. So there's this boom of new antibacterial agents, which was terrific. The problem is that the bacteria can mutate their genes or through a process called conjugation um, bacteria of different strains can trade genetic information. And so it's interesting, one of the things I'm going to talk about at the student uh, award ceremony today, one of the fellows who helped to start Combinatorics was a fellow who became a dear friend, Joshua Letterberg. And Josh Letterberg won the Nobel Prize for figuring out this process of conjugation where uh, bacteria of different strains can trade genetic information. So what the bacteria did when penicillin came along there's the key component of penicillin is a four-membered ring called the beta-lactam. The bugs come up with something called beta-lactamase where they blow that ring open and they make penicillin useless. So we go back to the drawing board and say, I know penicillin hit a great target. I'm just going to get a new type of drug to hit that. So I'm going to come up with now the, they find the tetracyclines from the natural products. So tetracycline comes along basically as a penicillin replacement. And of course, we make millions of variants around penicillin to try to rescue it. While that's going on, there's another bubble in the 50s where we're getting some drugs approved. But the bacteria just keep mutating. Now, since 1950, I think there's only six or seven new drugs that have been discovered. Nothing since 2003. And so while we're sleeping, the bacteria are constantly mutating and trading genetic information on how to beat these drugs. And so what we have is becoming less and less effective. And last year for World Health Day, the World Health Organization said drug resistance is the number one health issue facing the world right now. I mean, that's a pretty strong statement from the WHO. The problem is when we go back, and this was an experiment that was run at GlaxoSmithKline when I was there, the bacterial genome was sequenced before the human genome because it's a lot smaller. So it was a tractable problem. So now we have the bacterial genome sequenced. It heralds a new day in drug discovery because we can then go in and selectively knock out gene after gene and say, what happens to the bacteria when I knock that gene out? If the bacteria dies when it doesn't have that gene anymore, that's called an essential gene, meaning I knock that out, the bacteria dies, people don't. That's a good thing. So Glaxo went in with its entire compound collection. At the time, it was smaller. It was 530,000 compounds. They picked, out of 300 essential genes they discovered, they picked 70 to run high-throughput screens against. So against every single one of these 70 high-throughput targets, or these protein targets, they ran 530,000 compounds in duplicate. So a little over a million. It's about a buck a well to screen these things. So a million dollars to throw 70 times. They got nothing. And oh, by the way, Merck ran the same experiment. So did Pfizer. Um, Everyone ran it, everyone got the same result. And everyone said, well, we got nothing. Forget about it, we're out. Well, the problem is the bugs don't care that we quit. They just keep mutating. And so what we have is becoming less and less effective. Everyone knows it's happening, but no one does anything about it. Because they said, well, we tried and we failed. What do you want us to do? So Pfizer just quit. Um, they got out of the space. Eli Lilly made most of its money over the years, and that space is completely out. So many of the companies have just left saying, well, we can't do anything. And oh, by the way, you can't make a lot of money once you um, uh, discover these drugs. So this is a place where a new type of institution like the Broad Institute can take on those problems. And it's not just bacteria. It's malaria, TB, dengue fever, leishmania, these parasitic diseases that um, you know, most of the folks our age don't die from cancer or um, things like that around the world. It's from these parasitic or bacterial infections. That's what wipes out most of the folks. They don't make it to our age. <laughs> they don't make it to our age. You know? This is fascinating stuff and important stuff. Unfortunately, we're out of time. <laughs> but I want to say thank you for joining me today. And I hope you've enjoyed our show. Until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College.